This is Dave Doggett, and you're listening to the Maritime Outdoorsman Podcast, Episode 5. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the Maritime Outdoorsman Podcast. And in this episode, I'm going to be talking about the not-so-great outdoors. And, I mean, while we have all kinds of fantastic areas to explore in the Maritimes here in Canada, um, there are some things out there that you do not want to run into or encounter. Um, And in this particular episode, I'm going to touch on some of those things uh, with a particular focus on ticks and Lyme's disease. And in a few minutes, I'm going to connect up with Catherine Maroon, who has been very unfortunate, and she's got a story to tell us that will probably make you think twice or even maybe three times uh, before you step out into the great outdoors here in the Maritimes or virtually anywhere uh, in this country or anywhere in the world for that matter. So um, I'm just going to start with a little story uh, of my own that um, is definitely not nearly as involved or serious as uh, what Catherine is going to share with us. But um, it's just something else to keep in mind. A number of years ago, uh, I had a client who wanted to go fishing and Um, It was, I believe it was near the end of August. It was a smoking hot day. I think it topped out at around 33 degrees Celsius. And so I did take him to a location um, in Antigonish County where there was a river, still had, you know, some water in it. The water was low in most of the rivers in the province at the time, low and warm. Uh, So this was where I thought we had our best shot. And when we got there, I mean, it was just way too hot to consider putting waders on. So uh, we basically wet weighted it. I led the way and I wore Crocs, which, of course, have all kinds of holes in them, which makes it nice for walking. Um, And, you know, the water, the cool water would come in and and go out. So it would keep my feet nice and nice and cool on the hot day. But uh, what I didn't realize was that in several locations that we went to, there were leeches coming right into my Crocs and latching on. Now, you know, leeches are typically known as, you know, not not harmful in any way. And, you know, the medical profession uses them even for some procedures. But uh, in this particular case, I'm not 100% sure what happened. But um, when I was going from one location to the next, I did notice that, you know, my legs were bleeding at one point down on my feet in different locations. So, I just thought, you know, maybe I brushed my feet against, uh, you know, some of the blade grass or something like that. And then I did realize that I must have had a leech or two on there. um, And I did find another one that was still on. Now, in the process, I had ventured through a very muddy, uh, almost beaver, well, it was a beaver meadow. And I was, I was, there were several places where my feet almost got stuck in the mud. I mean, it was just putrid mud, um, but I didn't think anything of it. So what I was doing was um, where some of these leeches had already fallen off or been rubbed off, I had then exposed the open wound with, um, you know, this gross mud, which, you know, could very well probably does have all kinds of bacteria in it. Um, And then I also did have one leech that was stuck on my leg. And I decided, you know, I'm going to leave that one on until we get back to um, New Glasgow. And I'm going to do what the, you know, what all the books say. I'm going to pour salt on it and let it shrivel up and fall off. So um, I got back and um, I went to the washroom at a restaurant there. I got a salt packet, poured it on. Sure enough, the leech, you know, curled up and came off. Well, lo and behold, that was the wound that I got infected at. Um, and so what happened was, I, within a number of days, I noticed that uh, my leg, my whole leg was getting very red on the inside. And it was, it was progressing, um, you know, not fast enough that I could see it progress. But in a number of hours, I could see that it had progressed differently. And it was 
it was slowly going up my leg towards my groin, and it was, you know, a very dark red color. And uh, so it wasn't long before my wife said, uh, you're going to emergency. So I went to the emergency at the local hospital, and sure enough, the doctor said, yeah, it looks like you've got some kind of blood poisoning, and here's some antibiotics to get that done. So that was within, I think, two to three days from when, um, you know, I was out on that adventure. So it was kind of dangerous. Um, and I didn't end up that I know of, I didn't end up contracting any kind of, um, you know, super serious illness other than the, the infection during those few days. But, um, as you're going to hear when we talk to Catherine, uh, things can be a whole lot worse. And this is not designed to, you know, strike fear in everyone, but I think it is important that everybody keeps these things in mind, uh, when they are outside and, um, yeah, so lots of good info in this episode. It's a little longer than the typical show, but a lot of good info, and I really didn't want to break it up. So without further ado, um, let's connect with Catherine Maroon and uh, hear about her story and her introduction and where she's coming from. So hang on, I'll get her on the line. All right, everybody, I've got um, I've got Catherine Maroon on the line, and she's coming in all the way from California today. So hey, Catherine, thanks for joining me. Good morning. Thanks for having me on. Well, I know it's it's quite early for you over there. It's um, it's about eleven o'clock a.m. here, and when I'm recording this, I'm sitting in maybe five six inches of snow here, um, you know, south of Halifax. So, uh, how how are you doing today? And um, and maybe uh, uh, you can give us a little info of. Are you originally from Nova Scotia? I am definitely an East Coast girl. You can probably hear from the twang in my voice. <laughs> uh, I, I grew up in Halifax and, you know, spent some wonderful time in Bridgewater, where, where you are. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I married a Cape Bretoner. Okay. And my home, my home river is the Marguerite. You know, I'm, I, my favorite fish, my favorite game fish is the Atlantic salmon. Right. And I love fishing those tawny waters in the fall. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, it's uh, that's something that I, I've enjoyed doing myself for the last uh, 10, 12 years, I think, um, is about how long ago I, I started dabbling in Atlantic salmon. And uh, I haven't haven't been able to shake it. So uh, so you um, you you've you started a, a TV show a number of years ago. Maybe you can tell us a bit about that. Well, I grew up with brothers, and I, I know you've got two little kids. I don't know mm-hmm. if you've had them out salmon fishing. I know you've had them out doing other types of fishing. But mm-hmm. when I grew up, way back when, with the horse and buggy, <laughs> uh, you know, it was a time when girls weren't invited on the fishing trip. So I have an older brother and a younger brother, and my dad would take them fishing, and I wanted to be with my dad. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't understand why I couldn't go. Um, it just didn't make sense to me. So having a fishing career didn't seem a possibility. All the TV shows back then were, you know, male role models. We didn't have women fishing hosts. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't think it was possible. So my first career, I was a small business owner. I sold my business when I was 30 and I wanted to be a professional fly fisherman. So I trained and I, I was certified and I ended up shooting a pilot that got picked up, um, and I started airing in the U.S., and my goodness, that was, um, I guess I would have been 32, mm-hmm. and now I'm 45, and I'm still producing my show, What a Catch. Excellent. That's awesome. I, I, I think what most people don't know is that I wanted to start the, doing a show because I wanted to promote better fish handling Mm -hmm. uh, techniques. At that time, catch and release wasn't something anyone talked about. And I see fish as living, breathing animals, and I felt badly the way they were being handled, Mm -hmm. mishandled. And so when I started the show, it was showing fish being held in the water, uh, supporting their own weight and catch and release practices. And I traveled all around the world, I caught many different species, but I also caught more than I expected. I, I ended up with some very bad uh, illnesses, mm. travel illnesses. Mm-hmm. 
and bug-borne illnesses, unfortunately. And so now I'm trying to bring awareness because uh, we are more of a glo- global society, and mm-hmm. all of my fishing friends are being exposed to these uh, pathogens and not knowing, and it can change your life mm-hmm. permanently. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I guess that's kind of what um, got us connected. I noticed online that you were um, talking about Lyme's disease and ticks, and um, I, I really I had no idea that 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 had affected you. And um, so maybe you can sort of uh, bring us up to speed on on how how long you've been battling Lyme's disease and and how how did you contract it? Well, where you're living is a hotbed for ticks. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad you're aware of the issue. And, yeah. you know, we have a very healthy uh, ecosystem, but we have started living in tick territory. You know, we've, we've spread out into areas that... Um, so now we, you know, anyway. Yeah. It, it's a bit of a problem that people are becoming more aware of. But what happened with me is I was fishing out in BC, I was running a Casting for Recovery Canada event, which is a charity that I founded with my husband. Mm -hmm. It takes women who have breast cancer on all expense paid uh, fishing trips. Nice. And these days, since I live in Bermuda, we fly women over to Bermuda, all expense paid, and they they have a a girls getaway fishing weekend. It's quite wonderful. Excellent. But it was on one of these weekends in British Columbia that I was bitten by a tick, and I had a festering patch on my left thigh. And you don't always get a bullseye rash when mm-hmm. you're bitten by ticks, but but I had the classic uh, rash, high temperature, flu-like symptoms. And because I was with people who were immune compromised, I decided to go to the hospital and get checked out. Right. Because of my travel, I was worried I might have something that was contagious. Mm-hmm. And the doctors told me that I had shingles Hmm. and they didn't give me any medicine. And in fact, I didn't have shingles. I had Lyme disease. And what happened because I went untreated is that I slowly started to have these weird transient uh, symptoms. Hmm. So aches and pains and lethargy and uh, headaches and uh, vision problems. Well, Six years into this thing, Mm. I was undiagnosed. I had been to many doctors. I ended up bedridden and like someone who had Alzheimer's. So I could no longer drive the car. I couldn't work anymore. I was nauseous. I had a shopping list of of symptoms that um, could have imitated any number of 200 diseases. Wow. And I I ended up... uh, sort of self-diagnosing because I would go on the internet and plug in my symptoms and over and over and over again, Lyme disease kept popping up mm-hmm. as a possibility. So I sent away for a test from Igenix, which is a lab in California. And my Canadian doctor drew my blood, sent the test in, and it came back positive for Lyme disease. And then I found out to my horror that when a tick bites you, it doesn't just give you Lyme disease. It gives you parasites. It gives you viruses. Mm-hmm. It gives you other bloodborne um, parasites and and problems. And all of a sudden, it was like a deck of cards falling down. And uh, but fortunately, I've been able to afford treatment. I'm I'm in California at mm-hmm. a with a Lyme literate doctor. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Canadians are not able to get treatment because the protocol for treating Lyme in our hospitals is four to six weeks of antibiotics. And Lyme is the cousin to syphilis. And Mm -hmm. in most cases, four to six weeks does not eradicate the spirochet Mm -hmm. that is, you know, digging into every organ in your body and um, eating your, eating its way through you. Um, Mm. So there needs to be some changes in how we're dealing with Lyme disease in Canada Um, because people, once they get a a deep-seated illness, it's very hard 
to get rid of, and a lot of people end up with chronic illness. Wow. Um, yeah, that sounds that sounds terrible. So, are are you saying that? Um, be, so, uh, I guess where do I start? So, you you went six years undiagnosed. Is that correct? I went six years undiagnosed, and this is a pretty heavy price to pay for going to catch a fish. And yeah. I'm not saying to people not not to go and enjoy mm-hmm. our outdoor heritage. What I'm saying is be aware, wear bug spray, mm-hmm. check yourself and others for ticks, because some of these ticks, especially in the spring, can be as small as a poppy seed. When you come in from fishing, throw your clothes in the dryer. They'll live through the washer, but they won't survive the heat of the dryer. Throw Mm -hmm. your stuff in the dryer, have a shower, wash your hair with soap and water, and then, you know, you should be clear. But prevention is is the best defense that we have. And there are uh, ways of treating our pets because our our pets bring Mm -hmm. the fleas and ticks into our homes. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's also something you have to be aware of. Um, it's a big problem. Yeah, um, I know. You know, I've seen my share of ticks, especially in this part of the Maritimes where I live. I, I, I remember portaging uh, part of the Lahave River with a friend of mine a few years back, and by the time we were done, I mean our waders were covered in ticks, and luckily we didn't have any, you know, on us that that bit or anything. So, what? Do they know, you know, like what percentage of ticks carry Lyme's disease? Well, it depends on what what region you're in. For mm-hmm. example, here in California, there's sort of an 80% of the ticks have some tick-borne illness. Lyme is just one mm-hmm. of the illnesses that they carry. Um but that we use the word Lyme a lot because it's kind of an umbrella term that right. most people will understand. Mm-hmm. But within that umbrella, there are many blood-borne illnesses that are, you know, tick-borne illnesses. And and it's not just the ticks to be wary of. It's bed bugs, it's fleas, mm-hmm. mosquitoes, gnats, any bug that bites. Mm-hmm. It it will transmit parasites. Bacteria, mm-hmm. um, you know, it, it, real issues. Yeah, and sometimes you can live with these diseases and and not realize you have them. And our testing is not the best. There's a lot of false negatives. Um, so mm-hmm. just because you test negative for some of these diseases doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have them. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of laws are being passed now in different states that say if you have the telltale signs, you should be treated, and they're not prosecuting doctors in Mm -hmm. these seven different states for treating beyond the four to six weeks with antibiotics. Mm -hmm. But if you're living in Canada, you're really out of luck, and I think we need to get the conversation happening, like you've opened up this platform Mm -hmm. to bring awareness to people that this is what's happening to Canadians if they get these illnesses. Uh, Something needs to be done. We need to make it possible for doctors to treat for longer than four to six weeks with antibiotics. Yeah, so um, so you've you've kind of uh, taken on a role trying to spread the word about this sort of thing. Is there there some kind of um, push for for legal changes in in the system that that you're behind? Well, there there isn't. It really is just a case of I'm on Facebook, Mm -hmm. and all of my friends are are fishermen, anglers, um, and they're spending a lot of time outdoors. They've got a lot of exposure, and I just feel that I need to speak up about what is going on because it's in our blood supply. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, it is passed from mother to child. Um, it is the cousin to syphilis, so some people feel that it can be sexually transmitted, but mm-hmm. the science hasn't backed that up. Mm-hmm. Um, many, many more people have Lyme than are being diagnosed. There's a map that shows how incessant it is 
over the border with the U.S., but then when you come into Canada, the map indicates that there's hardly any Lyme disease. Mm. Well, that's a joke. The mm-hmm. ticks can't tell where the border is. No. Of course we have just as much infection. And the people who really know what's going on are the vets because the vets are testing pets mm-hmm. and they're coming back positive for these illnesses. Well, it's only common sense that if our pets have it, mm-hmm. then likely we have it. Um, and, and it doesn't mean you have to be bedridden and in really poor condition to have these illnesses. It, it can just live in you and mm-hmm. annoy your immune system and distract your immune system. And the problem with this is that opens you up to other illnesses. So a lot of people that have Lyme disease and don't know it end up with cancers or, or different autoimmune issues. But what triggered the whole thing to begin with is undiagnosed Lyme disease. Wow. It, or tick-borne illness. Yeah, it's a, it sounds like a, a massive issue. And hopefully, you know, hopefully over time we'll we'll get some get some more attention to it in at least here in Canada. So in the states they're fairly on top of this? No. No, but it's it's a numbers game. Uh-huh. The sheer numbers of people becoming sick have started a grassroots wave of change. It's just uh, you know, the insurance companies are not covering people. My treatments are incredibly expensive. And um, most people are suffering and dying a slow, miserable death because they quite simply can't afford treatment. And the insurance companies aren't covering off the cost because it's not being recognized Mm -hmm. as, uh, as it needs to be. But seven different states have changed their laws. And so slowly... Mm -hmm. The change is happening, but it's not happening fast enough for the people who are sick right now. And I go into the clinic, there are people paralyzed. There are people who are, who have lost their battle with the illness. Um, There are people like me who uh, I've lost my quality of life. I have a chronic illness that, Mm -hmm. that affects my, my entire body, my brain, my adrenal system, um, my heart, um, you know, just Every system has been affected, and uh, but you know I'm in treatment, so I have hope. Mm-hmm. Uh, some people don't have hope, and we need we need to change this in in our rich society mm-hmm. where we have health care. Um, we shouldn't people shouldn't be not able to get treatment for this. No, it, it definitely sounds like it's something that's sort of. Um, up and coming, and you know, it, it's gonna. We're gonna see more and more of this kind of thing. I would think. Um, well, what... it's the fastest growing disease in North America, and uh, in Canada, there's a doctor called Bert. Um, you know, gosh, what's his name? Oh, now I've forgotten his name. That's okay. <laughs> we can we can add it in uh, later. There, yeah, there's a there is a Canadian doctor who has lost his license for treating Lyme patients. And now he volunteers his time and he speaks up about what is going on in Canada. Mm. Uh, yeah, I'll have to look up his name. I just, unfortunately, my memory is... Uh, sure, no, no problem, no problem. Um, so uh, I guess, you know, one of, the, one of the main things would be, like, what should people watch for, like, if they do feel like they've been bit by something? Or how do you, how do you know if it's worth you know, getting checked out for, or if you're going to get looked at sideways if you go into the emergency? Well, David, that is just the greatest question because I've been in front of a lot of doctors mm-hmm. and and they when they go to medical school, these doctors have a paragraph in their textbooks about Lyme disease. So unless they've had a personal experience with the disease, they are really dismissing it, and if they even, even if it comes to mind at all. So I've gone into the hospital where I've had seizures, and they're not connecting the fact that this could be because of a bug bite. Mm-hmm. Um, so the first thing I would do is I wouldn't remove the tick myself. I would go immediately to a doctor or a hospital 
and insist they remove the tick, not by pulling it out, but by putting freezing under the skin with a needle that causes the, the skin to swell, and mm-hmm. then the tick will pull out on its own. If you pull a tick out yourself, mm-hmm. it will excrete juices into you as it's being pulled out. Mm-hmm. And so the best way is for, for the tick to pull back on its own power. Mm-hmm. Then you put it into a test tube or a baggie, send it off to a lab, because they can identify what diseases that tick is carrying. That way you have a fighting chance to target those diseases specifically. Right. Also, I wouldn't leave the doctor's office at the hospital until they wrote a prescription for antibiotics. I would insist on a short round of antibiotics. Mm -hmm. It's a quick uh, fix and an inexpensive solution to what can otherwise be, you know, a game of Russian roulette. Mm -hmm. If you end up with full-blown Lyme disease, you will be spending your entire savings, I can promise you. The long-term repercussions of this disease, um, it's a rich man's disease. Wow. That is that's that is terrifying. And, uh, you know, I mean, I'm sure it is to everybody who's who's listening for sure. So, so what is the prognosis for, you know, for people who are treated? It's a no-brainer if you get on this thing fast. If you end up with late-stage Lyme, it's, um, it's years and years and years of treatment, and it usually ends up, well, it quite often ends up as a chronic situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, um, I... Um, I've, I know, I think I only know one or two other people that, that actually have or had, or like, do you, is it something that, um, can be cured or is it basically just a, a lifetime of treatment? Well, it can be cured if they catch it, you know, very soon Early. after. It. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I don't want people letting doctors say to them, you don't need antibiotics, mm-hmm. and, and waiting for them to have symptoms. Once they have symptoms, they're screwed. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, if, if you could see what my life is like, mm-hmm. um, it we're like all these people that have this are like the Walking Dead. They're like zombies. Mm. Um, you know, I have, uh, I just have so like my day to day life is painful. I, I'm throwing up all the time. I can't get rid of the parasites because these I'm treating three different kinds of worms right now because mm. of these ticks they gave me. You know, I've, I'm taking medicine that was made in India and given to animals for parasites because wow, I can't even get rid of, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, it's, it's painful. I'm a bad color. I... You know, my hair's falling out. My mm-hmm. my nails are not growing in properly. I've got, you know, fungal infections in my lungs. Mm-hmm. I've got, you know, I mean, it's it's so devastating what this does. Um, it's it's really ba- it's so much worse than than what the public knows. Yeah, because I mean, all I. You know, all, uh, the, I knew of one fellow from Connecticut who uh, who got it, and I think I don't know when they detected it, but it sounded like it probably wasn't soon enough. And all I all I understood, you know, from hearing about him was that you know it just sounded like he was kind of lethargic, and you know there there wasn't there isn't a whole lot more out there than that you know that it kind of just wears you down and you don't hear the real nasty details yeah uh, um and and that is part of the problem Mm -hmm. i mean at this clinic that i go to uh people sit with me we do these ivs like i'm hooked up to ivs um sometimes 12 hours a day Mm -hmm. and um the medicine is the treatment for this is as bad as the illness. Mm-hmm. So what, what happens when you take these IVs of heavy-duty antibiotics and all these other medicines that are antimicrobials, um, 
they kill the bugs, but when the bugs are dying, they give off a gas that is very toxic. Mm -hmm. So people end up having seizures. There's a lot of vomiting, you know, temperatures. You just feel like you're dying. I mean, it's, mm. it's horrendous. Um, last night, I had to take six gravel to get myself through the night. Every couple of hours, I'd have to take more gravel. The night before, I was lying on my bathroom floor. I'm in a hotel room by myself. My husband's away. Mm -hmm. I had a high temperature. I couldn't stop throwing up, mm. you know, and then... Uh, you know, I'm pooping out worms mm -hmm. and I mean, it's absolutely horrendous. It's absolutely, I mean, it is so, it is just hell on earth. It is absolutely wow. hell on earth. That... And I don't know, I don't know if I can ever get better. Um, right now I'm dealing with, um, you know, my, all my, all my systems are, are not working properly. So my, I've got hormone imbalances. I've got hypotension. I, I've developed diabetes. I have blood clots in my veins that they're trying to deal with. I have uh, major digestive diseases because of the worms and the bugs. Um, I mean, it's, it's, and then my brain, my brain has lesions from, because the, the ticks and the, they're in my the, the spear shades are in my brain, so they're eating my brain. And uh, so, uh, you know, when I first went to the doctor here two years ago, I couldn't speak properly. It was like I had uh, a stuttering problem. Mm -hmm. I couldn't find words. You know, even now, I can't do a lot of things. Like, I, it's like I have um, Alzheimer's. Man. So it's really, really bad. Mm. And and so you're you're not alone. There's a clinic with with other people that that have have it to the same degree. Oh, there are people who are much worse off than I am. There are people that, you know, I was six years before getting treatment, but there are people there that have been sick most of their lives, and they're in wheelchairs. Um, they can't, they can't eat, they can't talk, they can't move, their, their, their feet are all bent under, you know, like you see those paraplegics mm, and they're all, yeah. and, um, you know, they're on feeding tubes and, um, it's really grisly, really grisly. Wow. And then there are people like in our circles that we hear about dying all the time or they commit suicide. Mm -hmm. Most people, because it's like having malaria. Mm -hmm. And so the, 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 the bugs, you know, they're in your brain and they, they, it's such torture. Um, and people get so depressed that a lot of them commit suicide. Wow. It sounds like something that makes a person want to move to the Arctic. Yeah. Well, you know, this, this is around the world now. I was mm -hmm. fishing in Iceland this summer. I was shooting my show there, and uh, it was my 45th birthday, and Ori Bigfoot's 75th, and um, you probably know about Ori, you know, saving the Atlantic salmon. Mm -hmm. He's just very, um, anyway. Mm -hmm. So I celebrated my birthday with him, and, and we filmed it. But even in Iceland, they have this problem because they, all of the ticks come in on the bird migration. Oh, they have yeah. a huge migration and uh it's it's a big problem and then all the kids that have this they all you know people diagnose them as having um like um attention deficit disorder right, or these right. sorts of, and it's actually Lyme disease so if somebody thinks that you know their kid might have this or they might have it here in Canada, can you just go get tested? No. The test is always false negative in Canada. You see, what happens is the, the, the virus rubs against proteins in your body, mm -hmm. and that becomes a shield. So your immune system thinks it's its own body. It doesn't recognize it as a virus. So it doesn't see the bacteria. And so if your immune system doesn't see it, it's not killing it. 
And if it's not killing mm-hmm. it, the test that they're doing is picking up the the dye off. Right. And, but if there isn't anything killing it, then you're not going to pick up on it. So sometimes um, the the best way to do it is go by symptoms. And so you mm-hmm. go to a Lyme literate doctor in the U.S., you get diagnosed, then you get that doctor to work with your local doctor for treatment. Mm. And um, there's a test from iGenix. I'll email you the link. Yeah, so for I would sure. Get that and then sometimes six months into, you know, your treatment, you get tested again, and then you'll see the die off. Uh-huh. But, um, you know, some people, and and it's not just Lyme disease you have to get tested for. It's all these, I'm going to send you a link. It's, it's a Beriscano's outline. Mm-hmm. He's a, a U.S. doctor that outlines all the different bug-borne illnesses that you can get from a tick bite or a mosquito bite. And those are all the diseases that you need to keep an eye out for. Mm, so this test can test for all these different things? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But again, you know, it, it, I would go by your symptoms yeah. and treat based on your symptoms rather than a test that, that comes back. Mm-hmm. But I definitely wouldn't go to any Canadian test. I just wouldn't even mm-hmm. go there. And then if you do suspect you have it, but the test comes back negative from Igenix, I would go to a Lyme literate doctor and get them to assess and do some additional testing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because sometimes what happens is they'll do a stool analysis test mm-hmm. and they'll pick up that you've got issues in your digestive tract. And there's a lot of common illnesses that Lyme people get. And so sometimes you just have to work backwards that way. Okay, I see. Man, it sounds incredibly complicate, complicated and complex and just a nightmare all around. And um... Yeah, like when I got it um, and I, when I started to get really sick, I'd get in the car to go to the grocery store and my brain was so messed up that I would just drive in a straight line. Like, I would forget Mm. that I was going to the grocery store, and all of a sudden I'd realize that I'm just lost. I'd be in the car driving and driving and driving and have no idea where I was going or what I was doing. Wow. And so call my husband crying that I didn't know where I was, and it was really bad. Or I'd go to the grocery store, and I'd keep buying lemons and garlic, lemons and garlic, and I'd open up the fridge, and there'd just be all these lemons and garlic because I... My brain wasn't working properly. There's so many Lyme clinics here because the Lyme is such a big problem. Mm -hmm. And and just in the last three weeks, they've diagnosed a new type of Lyme disease that there isn't even a test for. And they realize it's been around for a long time and people don't even get a rash when they get it. Only 50% of people get a rash. And a rash is like, it can look like uh, just a red patch like Mm -hmm. a mosquito bite Mm -hmm. it doesn't even have to be anything more than that so and if the if the thing bites you in your hairline you wouldn't even see it no there's no pain associated with some of these bites you mean no not at all because they put an anticoagulation in Mm -hmm. when they bite you so you don't Mm -hmm. even feel it right and some of them are some of the ticks are so small that you wouldn't even see them even when they're engorged and the other misinformation that these sites put out, you know, these different um, government sites, if they say, oh, it's got to be on you for 12 hours. Well, that's bullshit. Mm. As soon as their secretions get into your bloodstream, you've got it. Yeah. Man. Scary, scary stuff. Um, so yeah. are, are you, well, do you feel like you're getting better? No, I'm in, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. Yeah. Um, you know, when you get to the point where I am, where, um, it's, I'm in, I'm in trouble. I mean, it, it's not good. Mm. Well, so, um, you know, keep on keeping on, I guess. And, you know, keep, yeah. keep spreading the word and, you know, maybe, maybe they'll come up with something 
you know, I, there's a lot of smart people out there, but, you know, unfortunately they're not always working on the, on the, the right things. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's, I'm just holding on and hoping that a, a better treatment comes up, comes along. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and I'm just hoping that my complications, you know, that there's, um, there's, a uh, Magnata Wines in Ontario and this very wealthy man who, started the winery he died of Lyme disease Mm -hmm. and um you know this was someone who had all the money for all the treatments and you know very similar Mm -hmm. situation but um unfortunately once you get stage three Lyme it's 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 Mm -hmm. just really tough Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. well again you know thanks for taking the time to to chat with me about this today makes me want to stay inside. I'll say that, and I and I do. I have two. Well, I have two young kids. I got a seven year old son and a just a one year old son, and I haven't seen any ticks, you know, right in our backyard. But I'm sure they're around, and I know they're, you know, they're all over the place, not far away. Yeah, and it's the mosquitoes too, mm, and, yeah. and the fleas. Um. So yeah, you know, I to be honest, um. I don't go uh, off sidewalks or I'm uh, now I'm, I'm so concerned about Mm -hmm. getting reinfected because if I got an infection on top of this infection, it would would definitely kill me. Oh man. And so, you know, it, it, it's changed my life so much because Mm -hmm. I grew up, Mm -hmm. I lived outside. I was more comfortable in the outdoors than any anything else and i spent my life outdoors Mm -hmm. so to lose um Mm. like fishing for me was my identity it was my passion it was it it was my life Mm -hmm. and um so not only have i lost my health but i've i've really lost lost uh, your your identity in a way yeah yeah because quite honestly i'm not willing to put myself at risk anymore like i I'm hoping to to get well enough that I can keep training as, you know, a casting instructor mm-hmm. and that sort of thing. But, but my time on the, on the river is, um, I'm not sure that, that I'm going to be able to do that anymore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's, it's very, very difficult. Um, I do have a new show coming out. I've been working on it for a few years, but, uh, I do have a new show coming out all about my journey through this. And okay. it, it's all my evolution um, as an angler mm-hmm. and how how my attitude about fishing and what I want has changed mm-hmm. over the years because of this illness. Yeah. And uh, I'll, I'll make sure that I send it your way when it's done. I... I was hoping to have it finished by Christmas, but mm-hmm. I just haven't. Um, no, I haven't I'm, been able to. Yeah, understandably for sure. You know, I'm very open about what's mm-hmm. going on. Mm-hmm. I think it's the only way for people to really understand. Yeah, yeah. You, just, I mean, you just don't hear about it. You, you don't. Um, I mean, yeah. I've, I, I've never heard, I've never heard a story like yours, and. And, you know, you're, like you say, you're, you're far from alone. And I just don't understand why this, why it isn't being talked about more. I don't understand why it isn't being talked about more. Mm. I don't understand why it isn't being talked about more. Uh, Dr. Murakami is the BC doctor who lost his license. Uh, mm. M-U-R-A-K-A-M-I, I think. Okay. Uh, but I'm not sure. But if you Google him, mm-hmm. you'll see what I'm talking about. Mm. Well, may, yeah, maybe I'll. Um, well, we'll definitely put a link out, some some links and some information. And who knows? Maybe, maybe I don't know. Maybe he's available to uh, to talk on the subject as well. He would. He would yeah. for sure. He, yeah. He's desperate for people to learn about what's going on, and I think. The most scary thing is, do you know that they don't even test for these illnesses in the blood supply? So, <laughs> so it's you, in the blood supply. So you have, you go have and, a, a blood transfusion, and you could very well walk away with it. 
example, you don't even need a blood transfusion. 2,000 different products are made from blood and blood products. You have 2,000 different possible ways of being infected with bug-borne illnesses via the blood supply. Wow. And I wrote, I wrote, I wrote a letter to the Red Cross and asked them about this issue. And they wrote back to me. I have in writing mm-hmm. the fact that they don't check for these illnesses uh, because they have said there isn't adequate testing mm-hmm. at this time. And that's true. That, wow. that tells you that we don't really have a good way to test for these illnesses. And that's why people need to be treated based on symptoms. I, I don't know. I, hopefully we can make leaps and bounds, and at least in the testing end of things, over the next little while. Well, even if we could make it possible for doctors to treat without the threat of losing their license. Yeah, that, that, that seems a bit ridiculous. And Well, hopefully we can you know, help spread the word a bit about this. And um, we'll, you know, is there, you, maybe you can give me some links to, uh, to, to websites or um, information that people can, can quickly access. Uh, and I'll put that in the show notes for, for this episode. Um, That's a great idea. Yeah. I really appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to chat with me this morning, especially early this morning about this and, you know, if there's anything else um, that you want to add, feel free to. Otherwise, um, you know, you can uh, email me or message me anytime and I can add it in um, at a later time. Well, thank you, David, for providing a platform and bringing awareness to the plague of, of our time. Well, I'll, I will do everything I can. And uh, and again, thanks for taking the time to chat with me today about this and and hopefully uh, everybody who's listening will be will at least be more aware when they're out, you know, trudging through the wilderness and and maybe they you know get bit by an insect and they'll they'll think twice about it. So, thank you and uh, and uh, we'll keep in touch. Okay, tight lines. Yeah, you too. Well, thanks again to Catherine Maroon for taking some time out of her day and her. Uh, stressful schedule, um, as you can hear that she's going through, to bring us up to speed on you know her current situation, so that we can all you know be a little more aware of uh, what we're doing when we're in the great outdoors, so that we keep it the great outdoors and not the not so great outdoors. Um, I also want to follow up with um, in the show notes for this episode, which can be found at maritimeoutdoorsman.com slash 005 for episode five. Um, you're going to find a little bio about Catherine there, as well as some links to uh, websites that she has and information that she's provided me with so that you can find out more about her story and more about uh, Lyme's disease and other uh, conditions in general. So um, that's going to be a big help. And I also want to say that if you've got a, a story that you want to share with us about your experience in the outdoors, whether it's uh, something related to insects or uh, animals or whatever it is that your particular story in the outdoors um, is worth sharing, you can do that a couple different ways, actually. Um, the first way is if you're already a registered user on NovaScotiaFishing.com, NovaScotiaHunting.com, or NewBrunswickFishing.com, or NewBrunswickHunting.com, we've got a designated forum within each of those sites called the Maritime Outdoorsman Podcast. And you can just post your story in there um, and let us know. Uh, or uh, we'd love to hear from you directly on the Maritime Outdoorsman website where you can post a comment related to each episode. So you can find episode five and then you can uh, enter a comment directly to that episode and there's a couple different things you can do there one you can just type a message in and let us know what it is that's on your mind and your particular story 
uh, or what you thought of the episode. Two, you can click a little uh, leave a voice mail or voice message button, which will actually let you record your voice through your computer using a microphone. And you can leave us a voicemail, and we may very well use that in an upcoming episode. So those are the ways that you can get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening to another episode, and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks. Bye-bye.